Welcome back to The Cellar. Daniel John O'Brien was a 31-year-old landscaper from Roselle, Illinois. It was January 14, 1990, and Daniel was enjoying the last day of a dream vacation with a friend of his named Bruce McKenzie. They were enjoying their stay at the Bel Air Hotel, which borders one of the runways at Piarco International Airport, just outside of the Port of Spain, Trinidad. From all accounts, the vacation was an absolute success up to this point. The pair of men had a wonderful time and were planning on flying back home the following day, Monday. As Sunday continued on, Daniel would start to complain to his friend Bruce that he was suffering from some sort of mental health crisis. What the mental health crisis was has never been released nor definitively determined. Daniel, in a panic, would make a trip to a local drugstore nearby the hotel in an attempt to find a specific medication he was in dire need of. To Daniel's dismay, the drugstore did not have the medication that he needed. He would then proceed to travel to another drugstore, then another. At every turn, he was informed that they did not have the medication he was looking for. Daniel's condition would become more and more disoriented as the day went on, but as night came, Daniel appeared to be in a state that was okay enough for Bruce to decide no medical intervention was needed. Both men would proceed to go to bed, hoping for a good night's sleep prior to catching their flight the following day. About one hour later, Bruce woke to a naked man strangling him. In an absolute panic, Bruce would begin to fight for his life. He would eventually manage to push the man away from him, and it only took a moment before Bruce realized that this completely naked man in front of him was his friend Daniel. A moment after coming to this realization, Daniel would grab a lamp off the nightstand and smash it over Bruce's head. Bruce would stumble to the floor beside the bed, still in a complete state of shock over everything that was transpiring before him. Daniel would proceed to jump onto Bruce, continuing the attack he had started. The men would roll around in a fierce battle on the hotel room floor, with Bruce finally getting the edge and managing to kick Daniel away from him. The friends would lock eyes for a brief moment, and Bruce realized he was no longer looking into the eyes of the person he once knew. It was as if some pure animalistic instinct had taken over Daniel in this moment. Before Bruce could do anything else, Daniel would take off running straight out of the hotel room. Daniel would run straight down the hall, down the stairs, and past the front desk of the hotel. He would exit out the front door and continue running down the street and into the night before him. As Daniel kept running, he would arrive at the nearby airport. But instead of entering the airport through a door, he would begin scaling the chain link fence. Now remember, Daniel is completely naked at this point, in some sort of manic state, and he manages to not only scale this fence, but the fence was topped with barbed wire. Somehow he managed to get over it and fell to the ground on the other side. As Daniel continued running through the airport grounds, he would pass a security shack located nearby where four security officers were stationed. These officers saw Daniel and were completely dumbfounded as to what was happening. Before they could completely get their bearings on the situation, it is believed that Daniel attacked. A brief scuffle would ensue and Daniel managed to overpower the four security guards and he subsequently stole their four-wheel drive vehicle. Daniel would drive the vehicle straight out onto the tarmac where he crashed the vehicle into one of the planes. The vehicle would become wedged underneath the wing and Daniel would hop out of the wreckage. At this point, the security guards who were in pursuit of him on foot would arrive and they witnessed Daniel exit the vehicle and begin to start rubbing the bottom of the plane. When Daniel had hit the plane, he had caused oil to start leaking out of the underside, which Daniel was now rubbing his arms into and then rubbing all over his body and into a wound that was located on his shoulder. Before anyone can apprehend him, he begins running away from the plane. As he starts running away, he freezes for a moment. In that moment, he stares up at the still running engine of the aircraft before him. The guards look on, still completely puzzled as to what in the world is going on. Daniel then looks back at the guards, back at the engine, 
and to everyone's horror in that moment, he leaps straight into the running engine. Daniel is completely decimated in that moment. His body shredded into more pieces than could be calculated. It was so bad, it was reported that garbage bags had to be used to collect what remains of his body were found. After it all transpired, the biggest question was what caused Daniel to go into such a rampage? Ultimately, whatever mental health crisis Daniel was going through at the time was never revealed to the public. A subsequent investigation into the situation would end up deeming the cause of death as suicide. My condolences go out to Daniel's family and friends, for this has to be one of the most gruesome fates I have ever covered on the channel. The Matterhorn bobsled opened on June 14, 1959, in Disneyland, which is located in Anaheim, California. The Matterhorn bobsleds are a pair of intertwined steel roller coasters that are modeled after the Matterhorn, a mountain located in the Alps on the border between Switzerland and Italy. It is the first known tubular steel track roller coaster. The ride itself consists of two separate tracks that run parallel to each other for most of the ride. They then intertwine and eventually deviate from one another at the loading areas. The two tracks are called the Fantasyland Track and Tomorrowland Track. These names stemming from which side of the mountains their loading lines begin. The vehicles originally held up to four passengers each, seated single file. But in 1978, after an upgrade was completed, the individual vehicles were joined into pairs with lap seating, which increased the ride's capacity to eight people per train. The safety restraints on the ride consist of a car seat belt. There are hand grips inside the cars. Padding within the cars is very limited, and the winding track has many sharp turns. This leads to a bone-shaking ride, reminiscent of an actual bobsled. There is one lift hill on each track. The bobsleds ascend parallel to each other at the start of the ride, climbing past walls featuring snow-like special effects. The top of this lift hill constitutes the highest point of the ride itself, though the mountain continues upward for several more stories. The rest of the ride is a mostly unpowered coast through the Matterhorn's many caverns and passageways. Today's story takes place on January 3rd, 1984. 48-year-old Dolly Young, a resident of California, was visiting Disneyland with a small group of friends. At around 3.30 in the afternoon, Dolly and her friends would get in line and eventually board the Matterhorn bobsleds. Dolly would end up sitting in the very back of the bobsled by herself, while her four friends sat in pairs in the seats just in front of her. The roughly 70-second ride would begin, and not long into it, Another guest on the ride would witness something straight out of a Final Destination horror film. A woman named Helen witnessed Dolly Young fall out of the Matterhorn bobsled. Dolly would go crashing onto another part of the ride's track below. It was said that after Dolly fell, she made an effort to get herself up on the track. But in an instant, another one of the ride's bobsleds would go crashing straight into Dolly. Upon impact, Dolly would be decapitated, and the bobsled would come to a stop on top of what was left of her body. With the bobsled now being stopped, the ride operators would get an alert and immediately shut down the ride in its entirety. Emergency services would be called, and Dolly Young was pronounced dead at the scene. The Anaheim police would immediately start an investigation into what transpired on this fateful day. Unlike a lot of other stories I've told on the channel, the investigation would find no mechanical issues whatsoever with the ride. The only thing that was found was that Dolly Young's seatbelt was undone, but not broken in any way. Disneyland officials would immediately go on to state that prior to the start of the ride, seatbelts are checked on every passenger not just once, but twice. In stark contrast, one of Dolly's friends was quoted later as saying that they had never checked her seatbelt prior to beginning the ride. To this day, the truth is not 100% apparent. 
Did Dolly take off her seatbelt herself while on the ride? Or did someone forget to check and make sure she was secure prior to the ride beginning? Dolly's family would eventually sue the park for $5 million. This resulted in an undisclosed settlement in March of 1988. Dolly Young was the fifth person to die at Disneyland, and according to my research, as of 2023, 27 people total have lost their lives at the park, but only seven of those fatalities occurred on rides themselves. As always, my condolences go out to Dolly Young and her family, as well as to anyone who has ever lost someone due to an amusement park accident. Yellowstone National Park is a nearly 3,500 square mile wilderness recreational area that sits atop a volcanic hotspot. Most of Yellowstone sits in Wyoming, with the park spreading into parts of Montana and Idaho. Yellowstone features dramatic canyons, alpine rivers, lush forests, hot springs, and gushing geysers, including its most famous geyser, Old Faithful. It's also home to hundreds of animal species, including bears, wolves, bison, elk, and antelope. Today's story takes place at Yellowstone National Park on July 20th of 1981. On this day, 24-year-old David Allen Kerwin from La Canada, California, was taking a drive through the park. He was accompanied by his friend Ronald Ratliff and his friend's dog, Moosey. At around 1 p.m., they made the decision to park their truck near one of the hot springs and get out to take a closer look. After getting out of their truck, Ronald's dog, Moosey, made a break for it and escaped from the vehicle. The dog had only one goal on its mind, and that was to go for a swim in the beautiful hot spring. Within moments of escaping, the dog dove into the water, and it became quickly apparent that something was horribly wrong. To give context to the overall scenario, the Yellowstone hot springs are found in abundance throughout the park. Due to it being a volcanic hot spot, many of these bodies of water reach temperatures upwards of 150 to 205 degrees Fahrenheit. To add even further context, when boiling water at home for something like pasta, a full rolling boil occurs at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Upon seeing and hearing the dog's distress, David and Ronald ran over to the hot spring to attempt to help the terrified dog. Within just seconds, it became apparent that David was going to act quickly and go in himself to rescue the animal. According to reports, numerous bystanders tried to warn David not to go into the water. Like hell I won't was the only response he had for the people watching on in horror. And just like that, David took two steps into the water and dove headfirst in to rescue Moosey. Miraculously, David managed to swim all the way out to the frightened dog and attempted to pull the dog back ashore. He lost his grip on the animal, went underwater, and then came back up and tried to climb up out of the pool. Ronald was then able to step into the water and help pull David the rest of the way out. Ronald would suffer second-degree burns on his feet as a result of the couple of seconds he stood in the water, but his friend David was in far, far worse condition. After being pulled out, David was quoted as saying, That was stupid. How bad am I? That was a stupid thing I did. Now, classifying this as stupid just simply isn't a fair assessment of the overall situation. Whether it be your child, your significant other, a family member in general, when a dangerous situation occurs, some of us have this built-in response. The need to save or rescue, no matter the risk there is to our own life. On this day, David reacted before fully thinking through the situation, and sadly, it would not end well for him. Upon his departure from the scalding hot water, David was blind and suffering from third-degree burns over 100% of his body. When a park visitor came over to help, he attempted to remove David's shoes, and David's skin peeled off with them. 
In fact, at this point, most of David's skin was peeling off from all over his body. David would be rushed to the Salt Lake City Hospital. There, doctors would do all they could to try and save David, but sadly, he would succumb to his wounds the following morning. As for the dog David jumped in to save, he sadly did not make it as well. In sharing David's story, I hope to make anyone listening more aware of the dangers within Yellowstone Park and the overall dangers in jumping into any kind of body of water before fully knowing what dangers could await. Story takes us to Surakarta, Indonesia. It was June 11, 2020. A 21-year-old man named Johannes Budai Santoso decided he would take his motorcycle out for a drive. All was normal on this beautiful day as he cruised the roads enjoying the breeze on his face. Until suddenly, something out of thin air snatched him straight off of his motorcycle. In an instant, Johannes fell to the ground with a thud. It would only take him a second to realize something was very wrong. Johannes felt an intense rush of blood from his neck and a severe tightening around his throat as if someone was strangling him with a fiber wire. Johannes would struggle and gasped for breath as he made every effort possible to get whatever it was that was wrapped around his neck. The slick and ever-growing presence of blood all over his hands and fingers made the struggle increasingly harder, but somehow he managed to free himself. A passerby saw the predicament Johannes was in and picked him up and sped to a local hospital nearby. Sadly, Johannes would not survive. He was pronounced dead at the hospital due to massive blood loss. So what happened? Well, it turns out Johannes was in the wrong place at the wrong time. As Johannes drove through the area, a thin glass kite string that had been stuck on an electrical pole near the roadway wrapped itself around his neck. Based on the speed at which Johannes came into contact with this glass kite string, it not only wrapped itself all the way around his neck, but it managed to cut deep enough to slice straight through his carotid artery. It was miraculous that he was able to free himself of the glass string, but he sadly stood little chance with such a massive amount of blood loss imminent. Daniel Jones was a 21-year-old man from Woodbridge, Virginia. He was a student at Northern Virginia Community College, and he worked as a computer systems engineer. Daniel, like most people, enjoyed going to the beach to get away from the hustle and bustle of everyday life. So, in August of 1997, Daniel and his girlfriend Julie took a trip to Hatteras Island, North Carolina. For most of the first week, they enjoyed the sights, and in particular, spent a ton of time on the beautiful beaches. It was August 7, 1997, at around 1.45 p.m. Daniel had spent a large chunk of that afternoon digging himself an eight foot wide, nine foot deep hole in the sand. Down in this hole, Daniel propped himself in a chair and was enjoying the privacy and shade from the sun above. Unbeknownst to Daniel, the hole he had dug was roughly 25 feet above the high tide mark. As the tide continued to creep in, water began seeping its way into Daniel's hole. It was 1.50 p.m. when, in an instant, the sand all around Daniel collapsed and swallowed him whole. Daniel's girlfriend, along with onlookers, immediately took action. They grabbed shovels and desperately began digging in an effort to free Daniel from his sand-filled tomb. Upwards of 20 people helped in a desperate effort, but as they continued digging, more and more loose sand continued falling back into the hole. It would end up taking over an hour, along with some heavy equipment, before Daniel's head would finally be located and dug free. 
rescue workers immediately put an oxygen mask on Daniel and began attempts at resuscitation. But by this point, it was far too late. Daniel would later be pronounced dead at the Hatteras Island Medical Center. Jennifer Riordan was a 43-year-old wife and mother of two children. Jennifer was the Vice President of Community Relations at Wells Fargo in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where she and her family lived. It was April 17th, 2018. Jennifer had just finished up her trip to New York City and was boarding the Southwest Airlines Flight 1380 from LaGuardia to Dallas, Texas. As Jennifer boarded the flight, she looked around and noticed the seat she was hoping to get had already been taken by somebody prior to her. So she settled for a seat by the window in row 14. Jennifer then placed her carry-on luggage in the compartment overhead and settled into her seat for the flight home. The plane would soon begin its takeoff ascent, and within minutes, passengers on the plane would hear a loud popping sound come from one of the aircraft's engines. Within a moment of hearing the noise, chaos would consume the cabin of the airplane. A fan had broken off engine 14 and had become a projectile aimed directly at the window where Jennifer had been seated. With little warning, this fan would crack and destroy the window. Just like a balloon, when the window inside an airplane breaks while in flight, the air within the cabin will instantly rush out taking with it anything loose within the cabin of the plane. With no time to react, Jennifer would instantly be sucked out of the now wide open window, head first. Numerous passengers would react quickly and grabbed a hold of Jennifer's legs in an effort to keep her in the plane. It would take them 10 minutes before they finally managed to get her back inside, and by then, the damage had already been done. Reports state that after Jennifer was sucked out of the window, shrapnel from the damaged engine would strike Jennifer in the head. A nurse on the plane would spend over 20 minutes in an effort to revive Jennifer, but the extreme blunt force trauma she had suffered was far too much for anybody to come back from. The plane would make an emergency landing, and emergency staff would make all efforts to save Jennifer, but she would later be pronounced dead. Eleanor Scarrett was a 50-year-old mother of three, from Margam, Wales. One of Eleanor's greatest passions was spending time in her garden with her many pets. She also formed a strong friendship and bond with her neighbor, Kelly McFarland, who spent a lot of time next door with Eleanor. It was July 24th, 2021, and Eleanor was doing just that. She was working in her garden and doing what she loved to do. As she continued cleaning around her back deck area, she opened up a hatch which was used to gain access to underneath the deck. Now, the details aren't super clear as no one witnessed the event unfold, but at some point, Eleanor would slip and fall head first. She was wearing shoes that looked loose and ill-fitting, which is believed to be a cause of why she was unable to regain her balance. When she fell, her head would become wedged within the hatch of the deck and a wall. It's unclear how long Eleanor would become stuck, but at some point later in the day, her neighbor Kelly would hear water overflowing from Eleanor's pond and subsequently glanced over to see what was going on. She would see Eleanor on her knees with her head stuck in a weird position, and she immediately ran to her aid. Kelly would call for emergency services but by the time they arrived, it was too late. An investigation into the incident would conclude that Eleanor had died due to positional asphyxia, a tragic set of circumstances that no one could have seen coming. Tony Isles was a 42-year-old husband and father of two children who lived in Maple Ridge, a city in British Columbia, Canada, that is located in the northeastern section of Greater Vancouver. It was September 9, 2021, and Tony had decided to pick up some breakfast at a local McDonald's. It was 5.30 in the morning, and he drove into the drive through and placed his order, as he had done on numerous occasions prior. He would then drive up to the window and grab his credit card, 
to pay for his purchase. As he attempted to hand the credit card to the cashier, Tony would drop his card. Without a second thought, Tony would open up his car door and attempt to pick his card up, when in an instance, fate would strike. Tony had not placed his car in park prior to opening his door and reaching for his credit card. As he reached for it, his car would begin to roll forward and Tony would become pinned between the car door and against a structural piece of the McDonald's restaurant. Now, I have read numerous reports on this incident, and there appears to be a second way in which the tragic accident has been reported. The second one being that the vehicle rolled forward and hit the McDonald's building and pinned Tony between his car door and the frame of the car itself. Either way, Tony would make all efforts to free himself, but the sheer weight and pressure from the car would be too much. Emergency services would be called to the scene, and numerous attempts would be made to revive Tony, but he would succumb to his injuries on site. Joseph Austin Smith was a 30-year-old man from Wichita, a city in South Central Kansas. He was a beloved co-worker at Brown's Plumbing Service and was described by friends as being the most unique individual I have had the pleasure of meeting who always had something to lift our spirits. From all reports I could find, it was Saturday, January 21st, 2023, and Joseph had decided to go hunting with a friend of his. They threw their rifles and gear in the back seat of the pickup truck and were on their way. At around 9.40 a.m., while Joseph was riding in the passenger seat of his friend's truck, fate would strike in a way that could never have been predicted. In an instant, a loud bang would go off within the pickup truck as one of the rifles in the back seat would discharge. Joseph's friend would immediately pull the truck over and call 911. When emergency services arrived, they would find Joseph's body in the passenger seat of the pickup truck. They would immediately make all efforts to revive Joseph, but from all reports, he had succumbed to his injuries instantly. So what exactly happened? Well, the rifles were not the only thing in the backseat of the pickup truck. After a thorough investigation into the incident, it is believed that Joseph's friend's dog, whom had been riding in the back seat, had inadvertently stepped on one of the rifles just right. In the dog's excitement for the day, he had been pacing around in the back seat, and his paw landed just right on one of the rifles. This caused the weapon to immediately go off, firing a bullet directly into Joseph's back, which subsequently resulted in Joseph's fate. Monica Meyer was the 70-year-old mayor of Betterton, Maryland. Monica was known as a very hands-on mayor who had no issue getting down and dirty while performing numerous tasks within her beloved town. In a lot of ways, Monica was a real person of the people, and she loved her town so much that throughout her tenure as mayor, she was recognized for always offering a helping hand, even in situations where it was hardly expected of her. To put it plainly, she was an official who truly cared. Sadly, her sheer love and drive to help would ultimately be her undoing. According to the Vedette newspaper, Mayor Meyer was known to consistently travel down to Betterton's sewage treatment plant to assist in cleaning out the waste tanks. It was March 20th, 1980, and on this day, Monica decided not only to go clean the waste tanks, but she made the decision to do so on this day by herself. As she worked on cleaning the tanks, she reportedly slipped and fell directly into a massive vat of human waste. Sadly for Monica, the human waste was described as being thick, putty-like sludge. She ultimately would drown, and her body wasn't found until later in the day by the plant's supervisor. This has got to be, by far, the shittiest way to meet your maker. As always, today's stories just go to show that you truly never know when your time may be up. I want to start off first by saying there are not a lot of details behind this first story, 
so in order to tell it to you all in a compelling manner, I did take some liberties based on the information provided. Ultimately, the outcome is 100% based on factual reports from the police department. So let's go ahead and dive in. It was a beautiful Sunday morning in Rancho Bernardo, California. An unnamed 28-year-old man had woken in a hurry that morning. In an absolute rush, the man grabbed his morning protein powder and tossed it into his cup with some water and ran straight out the door and jumped into his car. While driving, he came to a realization. I don't have anything to mix this protein powder with. As he searched around his car for something to mix his drink, he located his knife. He grabbed his knife and began mixing up his protein drink. As he continued to drive and navigate his drink, his car would begin to veer off the road. The man soon realized his error, but before he could react, his car would slam straight into a parked car on the side of the road. Four more cars that had been driving behind the man would proceed to slam into each other as a six-car pileup would occur. As you can see in the footage, this was a scary, dangerous scenario for all involved. Police and rescue workers would arrive quickly on scene to attend to those that may be injured. There at the scene, they would make a shocking discovery. In a manner that only fate itself can provide, they located the man we had been talking about still sitting in his car. The sudden accident had taken the knife that he had been mixing his drink with and propelled it straight into the man's neck. The man was grasping at his neck as blood poured out of the wound. Emergency services would get the man into the ambulance and rush him to a nearby hospital, where he would be immediately rushed into emergency surgery. Sadly, the man would not survive, as the blood loss he had suffered through the ordeal was too much for his body to take. If anything can be learned from this incident, it's don't drive distracted and don't play with knives, especially while driving. It was December 14th, 2002, in Lower Manhattan, New York City. Kyle McGarity had moved to New York a couple years prior from Holland, Ohio. At the time, he had landed a computer job near the World Trade Centers. But following the 9-11 attacks, he had lost this job, and at the time of the incident, he was working as a waiter to make ends meet. On the night of December 14th, it is reported that Mr. McGarity had gone out to have drinks with one of his neighbors, Keith Masters, and Keith's girlfriend. Now prior to diving any deeper into the story, I want to say that I looked through numerous sources on this incident, and there are some small changes I found throughout all of the reporting, so I will do my best to lay out what transpired as factually as possible. After a night of drinking, the group of three were walking back to their apartment building in Lower Manhattan. At some point along this walk, it is believed that Keith Masters and his girlfriend had gotten into some sort of verbal altercation. As the altercation grew in intensity, Kyle McGarity is believed to have tried to step in in order to de-escalate the situation. The group at this point were around Fulton and Pearl Street. As McGarity attempted to defuse tempers, reports say that Keith Masters grew ever more angry in his drunken state. This led to a scuffle breaking out between the men. Keith Masters stated that it was a friendly back and forth of horseplay, but onlookers on the night reported to police that what transpired was far more than that. As the fight grew in intensity between Keith and Kyle, it was reported that Keith at some point put Kyle in a bear hug up against a building wall. Kyle would fight his way out of the position and the men would roll around on the ground, each one trying to get an edge on the other. Now it is not 100% clear how the next set of events transpired, but there was a manhole cover near the area that the scuffle was taking place. Investigators stated that the wooden barriers, along with a nearly 100-pound vent stack, had been used to block off the manhole cover, and police believe it was intentionally removed. It was now 4.13 in the morning, as Kyle McGarity clearly lost the altercation. It was at this point that he would plunge 
15 to 20 feet down the manhole. Now a fall like that can be fatal in its own right, but Kyle would miraculously survive the fall. But this manhole cover had been blocked off for a reason. The manhole had an access point to a steam main buried below. The manhole was left open at the time to vent steam from a small leak in the main that Consolidated Edison workers had been trying to locate and fix days prior. As Kyle fell into the depths of the manhole, he would immediately plunge straight into scalding hot water and steam. His screams could be heard by those in the neighboring area. It would end up taking police and workers numerous hours after the incident before they could get the water and steam under control so they could recover Kyle McGarrity's body. An autopsy would find that he had suffered no real injuries from the fall itself, but that he had died due to the excruciating burns he had suffered on over 60% of his body. Keith Masters would end up being charged for murder, but ultimately the police didn't have enough evidence to take him to court and charges were later dropped. I know I say this a lot, but this has to be one of the most horrible fates I have covered yet on this channel. John Hutcherson and Francis Brom were absolute best friends since high school. Many people would say that they were basically brothers, but all of that would change during early Sunday hours in August of 2004. Francis, age 23, and John, age 21, were both young men with a lot of life left ahead of them. It was a Saturday night, and both men decided to do what they had done so many times before together. Start early, finish late, drink as much as they possibly can, and have a hell of a good time doing it. As the night went on into the early Sunday morning hours, one thing was very clear. They had overdone it this time. Francis had started complaining that he didn't feel well, and at that point, both men decided to call it a night. With both men incredibly drunk, they made the decision that John would drive home since Francis was feeling pretty certain he was going to get sick. John would then begin the trip home, taking roads that he had driven countless times in the past. At some point along the way, Francis couldn't keep his stomach in check any longer, so he rolled down the window and began expelling his stomach contents out the passenger side of the vehicle. Unbeknownst to either of them at the time, both their lives and the lives of their families would change in an instant. John continued driving, struggling to keep the car straight on the road, when he would suddenly clip a telephone pole support wire. It's unclear if John realized at this point that he had clipped something, but nevertheless, he kept driving and finished the 12-mile trip back to his house. He would arrive and proceed to exit the vehicle. From there, he went straight inside the house, hopped in his bed, and passed out. It wasn't until the next morning, when a neighbor walking by saw John's truck, that the police would end up being called. It was an absolutely brutal and gut-wrenching scene when the police did arrive. The first thing they did was check John's truck, and inside the passenger seat they would find blood everywhere, along with the body of Francis Brom, who was completely missing his head. Police would further knock on the door and wake John up. When John came to the door, he was still clearly inebriated, and police found him to still be wearing the clothes he had worn the night before. Covered in blood, John was absolutely shocked and gutted as to what had transpired. When John had clipped the telephone pole support wire, Francis's head was still out the window, and it took his poor friend's head clean off the body. It happened so instantaneously, Francis wouldn't have felt a thing. John Hutcherson would later plead guilty to vehicular homicide and was sentenced to five years in prison. But the guilt of living with his friend's death is something we'll have to live with for the rest of his life. So please, whatever any of you do, don't drink and drive. You may get lucky, or you may change the lives of others in ways you can't foresee. For fate will come for all of us at some point, 
but our bad decisions can result in far worse outcomes. Molasses is a thick, dark syrup that is created during the sugar making process. The sugar cane is first crushed, followed by the juice that is created then extracted. The juice is then boiled down to form sugar crystals that are then removed from the liquid. The viscous brown syrup that is left after the removal of the sugar from the juice is subsequently called molasses. This process can be repeated several times, each time producing a different type of molasses. Molasses itself can then be fermented to produce ethanol. The process involves first diluting the molasses in water to bring down the sugar concentration to about 8 to 10 percent. Then, if needed, ammonium salts are added. Following this step, the solution that is collected then has yeast added to it. To put it simply, during this final process, the sucrose is converted into ethanol. Why all the information? Well, the disaster we are talking about today took place at the Purity Distilling Company that was located near Keeney Square. At the facility, large amounts of molasses had been stored. The company used the harbor side commercial street tank to offload molasses from the ships. They would then store it on site before later transferring it by pipeline to the Purity Ethanol plant that was located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The tank that held the molasses stood 50 feet tall, or 15 meters, by 90 feet in diameter, or 27 meters. This massive tank held as much as 2.3 million gallons of molasses in it at the time of this incident. It was January 15, 1919. It had been a bitter cold January, but on this day, the temperature had risen above 40 degrees Fahrenheit, or 4 degrees Celsius. Just one day earlier, a ship had come in and made a delivery of fresh molasses. In order to reduce the viscosity of the molasses for transfer, the molasses had been significantly warmed up. It is believed that what happened next was due to the thermal expansion of the older, much colder molasses when combining with the warm, fresh molasses. It was around 12.30 p.m. Workers at the facility were busy with their daily routines. Some were taking their lunch breaks and enjoying the small bit of warmth that the day had provided them. Unbeknownst to all, things were just mere moments from taking a turn for the absolute worst. The ground began to shake. A deep rumbling, followed by a thunderclap, came from the tank holding the 2.3 million gallons of molasses. Onlookers began to hear what they could only describe as machine guns going off as the rivets shot out of the tank one by one. Before anyone could react, the tank gave way and a rush of sweet smelling air picked up and tossed numerous people like they were nothing more than dust in the wind. At the same time, a truck was hurled directly into Boston Harbor. The initial rush of air was followed by a torrent of molasses as it began to swallow up everything in its path, like the blob from outer space. It was truly a scene straight out of a B-level horror movie. Now to add more context to everything, the density of molasses is about 1.4 metric tons per cubic meter, or 12 pounds per US gallon. This means the molasses is 40% more dense than water. This means the molasses has a great deal of potential energy, and the collapse would translate this energy and turn it into a 25 foot or 8 meter high wave that was moving at upwards of 35 miles per hour. Entire buildings were swept straight off their foundations. What made matters even worse? is the temperature outside. Once the initial wave had passed, 
the molasses slowly became extremely viscous, trapping numerous people that got caught in the initial wave and making it next to impossible to escape from its sticky sweet grasp. Numerous people were crushed by the debris that was carried along in the first explosion of molasses. Others simply got caught in the substance and drowned as they were unable to free themselves from its unyielding chokehold. When all was said and done, 150 people ended up injured to varying degrees, while 21 people and a multitude of horses would meet their horrible fate on this day. In the aftermath of it all, 116 cadets from the nearby USS Nantucket would arrive on scene first. The cadets arrived at the accident and without any hesitation entered into the knee-deep lake of molasses, doing all they could to pull out any potential survivors. The Boston Police, Red Cross, Army, and Navy personnel would soon arrive on scene they too began to help in the search for survivors, while others tended to the numerous wounded. A makeshift hospital would end up being put together on site as doctors and surgeons and nurses worked late into the night and the following morning. For four days, all efforts were made to save as many people as humanly possible. At the end of the fourth day, the search would cease, as many of those that were left were so ensnared in the molasses that they couldn't even be identified. It would then take another three to four months before a few other bodies were located within the waters of Boston Harbor. The cleanup itself would take weeks to complete, as several hundreds of people contributed to the daunting effort. In the aftermath of it all, 119 residents brought forth a class action lawsuit against the United States Industrial Alcohol Company, which had purchased Purity Distilling a couple years prior in 1917. It would be one of the first class action lawsuits in Massachusetts and has been praised throughout history for paving the way for modern corporate regulations. After a long three years of court hearings, the company would ultimately pay out $628,000 in damages, which is roughly $10.6 million in 2023 when you adjust for inflation. It's reported that families of the victims received around $7,000 each, which is roughly equivalent to around $118,000 today. The reason for why this tragic event occurred isn't 100% clear, but after a thorough investigation, there were several factors that are believed to have contributed to the event. One belief is that the tank had been leaking since the first day it was filled back in 1915. While numerous reports of poor construction in almost every facet of the tank's design have been pointed to. No matter the reason, 21 people lost their lives in this tragedy. I have covered numerous cases involving horrible fates, and this is by far one of the most terrifying ways to have your life extinguished. Thank you all for tuning in to another episode. If you enjoy the content, please hit the like and subscribe button. It helps the channel continue to grow. Also, you can check the description box below and find the link to my merch store. Tons of awesome designs and the proceeds help fund the channel. I also just started a new membership tier for the channel. It's $2.99 a month and comes with some pretty cool perks. So if that interests you, then please go check it out. As always, I do all the research, writing, recording, and editing for the channel myself. So anything you do to support the channel is greatly appreciated. Until next time, I will see you all again as we head back into the cellar.